Happy first Monday to you. Uh, my name is Neil Siegel. I co-direct the program in public law here at Duke Law School, along with my colleague, Chris Schrader. I also uh, research and write in the areas of constitutional law and federal courts. I'm going to be teaching a small section of first-year con law in the spring, and so I hope to have some of you in class. Uh, first Monday marks the beginning of the U.S. Supreme Court's term, uh, the October 2015 term. The court heard oral arguments in cases this morning, and what my colleagues and I are going to do uh, over the next hour is uh, put on your radar uh, some of the most important cases that the court's going to be considering uh, during during its term, with decisions expected by the end uh, by the end of June in all in all cases. Uh, this event is sponsored by the program in public law, uh, which uh, promotes better understanding of our nation's public institutions, of the constitutional framework uh, in which they function, and of the legal principles that apply to the work of public officials. Uh, the program in public law is made possible by the extraordinary generosity of uh, a great graduate of Duke Law School, Rick Horvitz, of the class of uh, 1978. Without Rick, uh, without his spouse, uh, Erica Hartman Horvitz, uh, events like these, other events that the program and public law sponsors throughout the year would not be possible. And so we are uh, profoundly grateful uh, to Rick and Erica for their, for their generosity. Uh, I have an all-star lineup of colleagues uh, with me today. Uh, Lisa Griffin to my left, uh, researches and writes in the areas of evidence, constitutional criminal procedure, and federal criminal justice policy. Uh, the other day I saw a favorite student of mine with an evidence book, and I asked how the class was going, and she got all starry-eyed and said, I just want to be Lisa Griffin when I grow up. <laughs> and so that just tells you just a little bit about... She needs to get out more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Lisa's going to talk to us uh, about some of the uh, unusual number of Eighth Amendment cases on the docket this term, as well as a case involving uh, alleged racial discrimination and, and jury selection. And then to Lisa's left is Daryl Miller, uh, 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 he, who researches and writes in the areas of civil rights, constitutional law, civil procedure, state and local government law, uh, as well as legal history. Uh, and he's going to be speaking about uh, a profoundly important First Amendment challenge to public employee unions, uh, which, is constitu which threatens to constitutionalize uh, this, this partisan political fight over public employee unions and right to work laws. You may, he may as well talk a little bit about uh, judicial, a judicial bias case. Um, uh, on the court's docket. And to Daryl's left is uh, my colleague Tom Metzloff, who's going to be talking about a case I imagine is on many of your minds, uh, Fisher. Uh, this is really Fisher too, the second time uh, a challenge at the constitutionality of UT Austin's affirmative action admissions policy is before uh, the Supreme Court in recent years. And we're going to find out uh, a lot about um, uh, the constitutionality, the legal permissibility of uh, affirmative action after Fisher II comes down by the end of this term. And uh, Tom also uh, teaches civil procedure here and may, may be talking about some important civil procedure cases as well. Uh, we'll see how much time we have uh, after they speak for 10 to 12 minutes. I may talk about uh, a vo an important voting rights case as well as a couple of cases in the area of abortion and contraception and religious freedom that the court has not yet granted uh, but that um, it is likely to grant um, um, and um, likely to be uh, uh, two, two, two very significant decisions in those, in those areas of law, likely by the, by the end of June. So let's, uh, let's begin now with uh, Professor, Professor Griffin. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. First Monday is an exciting day in the calendar for people like all of us. Um, <laughs> as Professor Siegel has started to outline issues like abortion and affirmative action and religious freedom and voting rights and public unions are sure to dominate the court's term, but a third of its docket is criminal. And despite the volume of cases, it's an unusual term for criminal law in many respects because so many issues are not on the docket that you would ordinarily expect to find there. The court recently denied cert in a very controversial Second Circuit case concerning the proof standards for insider trading, the Newman case, and that surprised many observers. Another thing that's been a surprise is at the beginning of this fall, the court had no habeas cases and no Fourth Amendment cases on tap. That is the first time that has happened in recent memory. Of course, 
The docket at the end of a term doesn't always look like the docket at the beginning of a term because they grant cases throughout the term. So it's hard to say exactly how it will shape up. Last week, the justices did grant cert in one habeas and one Fourth Amendment case, although both are relatively straightforward cases and not exactly blockbusters in those areas. It's very possible that a more high-profile Fourth Amendment case concerning searches of cell phones to pinpoint users' locations will ripen during this term, and that would certainly be a case to watch. But to a large extent, this is a classic lawyer's term for criminal law scholars, meaning there are very technical criminal law issues featured in most of the cases. What I mean by technical will become clear after a few examples. (laughs) Um, In Ocasio, the very first criminal case, which is set for argument tomorrow, the court will consider whether a conspiracy to commit extortion requires that the conspirators agree to obtain property from someone outside the conspiracy or whether transferring kickbacks among conspirators suffices. There is also a Hobbs Act case about whether robbing drug dealers is an inherent economic enterprise that satisfies the interstate commerce element as a matter of law. The court will also consider whether the government can use its forfeiture power to freeze untainted substitute assets that defendants may need to hire attorneys. And there is a case about whether the 2012 Miller versus Alabama decision holding the Eighth Amendment prohibits life without parole for juveniles applies retroactively on collateral review. Those are important cases, but they're deeply procedural and technical cases. Looking at the term from a slightly higher altitude, many of the court's criminal cases that are getting attention are the capital ones. The court reviews every execution that takes place in the country, and there is a background docket that keeps these issues at the forefront of the court's internal debates all the time. But this is a somewhat unusual constellation of cases in which cert has been granted and arguments will be heard. Looking at them together suggests three things to watch this term. The going forward role of the criminal jury, the culture of the court, and the future of the death penalty itself. First, a common thread comes from some principles the court has been considering in other contexts over the past several terms. Justices Ginsburg and Scalia, likely to be on opposite sides in some of these capital cases, have been allies in a series of decisions on jury determinations of sentencing facts, including Apprendi versus New Jersey, which requires jury findings of aggravating factors that increase criminal sentences beyond statutory maximums. They also agreed in Crawford that cross-examination in front of the jury is required before certain hearsay can be admitted. There has, in general, been a pretty marked movement in the direction of reinvigorating the trial jury. And in these capital cases, that principle might be put to the test. Hearst versus Florida, which is going to be argued next week, challenges a capital sentencing scheme that allows judges rather than juries to make factual findings about aggravating circumstances. Timothy Hearst was sentenced to death by a judge following a 7 to 5 recommendation for death by the jury. The jury's recommendation did not make clear which aggravating factors made him eligible for the death penalty or whether they found any aggravating factors beyond a reasonable doubt. But in Ring versus Arizona in 2002, which was authored by Justice Ginsburg, the court held that the question whether a defendant is eligible for the death penalty requires a jury determination beyond a reasonable doubt because Florida's capital punishment statute permits facts never considered by a jury to form the basis of a death sentence, there is a good chance that it will be struck down. That, in turn, could affect many other pending cases, and there are 400 inmates on Florida's death row. Tomorrow, the court will look at jury findings through the lens of three Kansas death penalty cases, Kansas versus Gleason and Kansas versus Reginald Carr and Jonathan Carr. The court will review the Kansas Supreme Court's decisions overturning the defendant's death sentences because their sentencing juries were not told that unlike proof of other facts in the case, the defendants did not have a burden to prove mitigating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt. Instead, jurors are supposed to individually assess and weigh mitigating circumstances. In the Carr cases, the court will also review the Kansas Supreme Court's decision that the defendants who are brothers should not have been tried jointly because some of their mitigating evidence was inconsistent or disadvantageous to one defendant or the other, and the jury considered all of the evidence together. 
Another <coughs> jury-related issue on the Capitol docket concerns Batson, a 1986 case holding that it is a denial of equal protection to put a defendant on trial before a jury from which members of his race have been purposely excluded. The court granted cert in the case of Timothy Foster, and that case will be argued on November 2nd. Foster is an African-American defendant who was sentenced to death by an all-white jury after Georgia prosecutors struck every prospective African-American juror in his case. This is an appeal directly from post-conviction proceedings in state court and not from a federal habeas decision, which also gives the court a little more substantive leeway. Foster challenged the prosecution's jury strikes as racial discriminatory at the time of jury selection, but the trial court permitted the strikes. Nineteen years after the trial, his lawyers obtained the prosecutor's notes from jury selection, and they contained information that contradicted the race-neutral explanations for the strikes that the prosecutors had offered at the trial. The notes reveal that the prosecution marked the name of each African-American prospective juror in green highlighter on four different copies of the jury list, circled the word black next to the race question on the jury questionnaires of five prospective jurors, identified three prospective jurors as B number one, B number two, and B number three, and then ranked these prospective jurors against each other in case, and this is in the notes, it comes down to having to pick one of the black jurors. Prosecutors said they struck each of the jurors for race-neutral reasons and that they did not use any of the highlighted lists in their final decisions, and the Georgia Supreme Court upheld Foster's conviction, but there seems a good chance that it will be overturned now. So we're going to be learning and thinking a lot about the jury from these different angles. Something is also afoot at the court culturally. While it reportedly remains the most collegial of our branches of government behind closed doors, the rhetoric in the public domain grows more and more heated. The gloves seem to be off. Justice Scalia never ever put any gloves on, um, but his colleagues have been surprisingly acerbic themselves lately. The death penalty is a good example. Last term, there were cases about whether the drug used for lethal injections led to cruel and unusual punishment. The court split along the five to four partisan lines you might expect. As they did so, Justice Sotomayor drew a vivid parallel between the way the court treated the chemical protocol and the logic it would have to extend to drawing and quartering or burning at the stake. Justices Breyer and Ginsburg wrote a separate dissent stating unequivocally that it is time to consider whether the death penalty can be applied consistently with the Constitution. Justice Scalia called their dissent gobbledygook, which frankly is mild for him. Justice Thomas said the real problem is prisoners who seek to have their death sentences overturned. And Justice Alito stated in the oral argument in the case that going after the pharmaceuticals used in lethal injections is guerrilla warfare on the death penalty. The temperature is already high in these cases, as in so many others, and it could go higher still. More importantly, and finally, we're going to be following the extent to which the death penalty itself is finally, somehow, phasing out, if only incrementally. I have repeatedly regretted efforts to read any Supreme Court tea leaves, but it is sometimes the case that cert grants in a cluster portend movement of some kind, perhaps less so in capital cases where there is a stronger argument for granting cert in general, but without a doubt there is a cluster of capital cases here. And even Justice Scalia recently made a public statement that it was conceivable that the court would eventually put an end to the death penalty. There are at most four votes right now to abolish it. Two we know of. Um, two are up in the air. But this has the court's substantive as well as procedural attention. And it's possible that in time, another justice, perhaps a new justice, will have the same realization that Justice Harry Blackmun did when he changed his 20-year position in 1994 and declared that he would no longer tinker with the machinery of death. Capital juries are part of that machinery and their composition and role are very much at the forefront of this term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Professor Griffin. We'll, we'll move now to Professor Miller. Uh, thank you, Neil, for having me out here, and thank you for coming in here about the um, new term. Um, I, uh, I chose two cases, uh, really, um, to sort of focus on for today. Um, Somewhat out of my wheelhouse, but I'll try to bring them back into my wheelhouse uh, as I discussed. The first is called Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association, 
and it's from the Ninth Circuit, and it appears at uh, first blush to be kind of a sleepy public union case. Um, teachers unions uh, under a 1977 case called Abood versus uh, Detroit Board of Education, um, that case uh, had held that a state uh, can have an agency shop. It can have one designated union um, uh, as the collective bargaining agent uh, to negotiate with um, uh, the state or with the municipalities, um, and that members of the union can be obliged to, to join the union or at least pay their fair share uh, of dues uh, to reap the benefits of the entire union bargaining process. Uh, the arguments in Abood uh, for why this was okay is uh, because it makes it easier to negotiate um, if you are a uh, public sector uh, employer, if you only have one union at the bargaining table as opposed to many, uh, it also avoids uh, certain types of free rider problems, that is, uh, individuals that are employees for the state or the municipality that would get the benefits of the collecting bargaining agreement but not have to pay uh, to get those benefits. Uh, but Abood also said uh, that uh, Portions of the particular uh, dues that were paid to the union uh, could not be expended against the will of the um, uh, the employee for certain types of lobbying or political activities, and so uh, a, a member of a public employees union has the right to opt out of the uh, portion of his or her dues that are being used for political purposes. And the argument there was that unlike collective bargaining, uh, this was a form of compelled uh, speech, uh, or later the court sort of shifted to talk about it in terms of compelled association, uh, and that um, was a violation of the First Amendment. The question in Friedrichs is, uh, first, uh, whether the plaintiffs, who are all members of a uh, Christian education association, uh, but are also educators within the California system, can be obliged to pay their fair share even for the collective bargaining representation. In effect, uh, really questioning whether the Abu decision from 1977 is uh, still good law or should be overturned. Um, and even if they can uh, be compelled, uh, whether it is a constitutional violation to require some sort of affirmative act on the part of the public sector uh, employee to opt out of the payments um, that are made as part of the political operation of a union as opposed to opting in. Um, this case, I think, is uh, one um, that can be sort of loosely described as the public uh, union death watch. So public unions um, are the sort of the last uh, bastion of uh, the labor movement. Uh, there's been a steady uh, decline of unions in the private sector, uh, and the public unions remain um, still pretty uh, much the, um, the primary locus of the labor movement. Um, and uh, they have been under lots of pressure, both from legislatures who have um, uh, basically outlawed certain types of uh, public sector unions. Uh, this is whether that um, process will continue through the um, activity of uh, constitutional and, in particular, First Amendment law. Um, the Supreme Court in recent years, uh, this is the third time that the Supreme Court has granted cert on a, a public sector union case. Um, two prior ones were in 2012 and 2014, and both raised serious concerns as to whether Abood was good law, and I think we might see some resolution uh, on that particular point. Um, but I don't pretend to be a sort of union um, lawyer or a labor scholar uh, by any stretch of the imagination. What I find interesting about this case um, is the broader implication about constitutional limits on uh, default rules and compelled association. So there's lots of scenarios in which governments, um, for reasons of avoiding collective action problems or free rider problems, um, uh, uh, encourage or even force people to associate together. Uh, and um, depending on how broad this particular case is uh, decided, it could have real implications uh, not only for things like public sector unions, but uh, constitutional limits on opt-outs versus opt-ins and class actions and other types of, um, uh, other types of devices that um, uh, 
are designed to, to get around these collective action issues. Uh, the second case, which I'll uh, mention briefly, uh, was just granted uh, cert this week uh, and is called Williams versus the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, and it's on certiorari from the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Uh, and this case uh, really has to do with judicial ethics um, and judicial campaigns. And like the um, prior case, it's inflected with some First Amendment issues as well. So in Williams, the petitioner, uh, Terrence Williams, is a murderer on uh, death row. Uh, the elected district attorney, whose name is Ronald Castile, uh, authorized the death penalty case against Williams, uh, remained the district attorney uh, all during the appeal process of Williams, um, and thereafter Castile ran for the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania uh, in elected position and during that campaign touted uh, his record uh, as sending uh, over 40 uh, individuals to death row. Uh, he won his election, uh, became a justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and thereafter became the chief justice of the court. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Williams was pursuing his appeals, uh, including allegations that the DA's office had uh, not put to, uh, turned over potentially exculpatory material. Um, as was the requirement of the DA's office. Um, the uh, case came up before the Supreme Court uh, of Pennsylvania, uh, and Williams asked uh, that um, the chief, now Chief Justice uh, Castile recuse himself from uh, the case, uh, which he refused to do. Uh, and then uh, the uh, court, uh, in uh, a unanimous opinion, decided to uh, uphold the uh, death penalty uh, uh, against Williams. So why this is interesting is it's a confluence of three uh, cases that the court has been struggling with uh, in light of the fact that in many states um, over half have an elected judiciary even to the state Supreme Court. The first is the fallout of a case from, two th uh, from uh, 2002 called, uh, or 2001 called Republican Party of Minnesota versus White. Um, this was a case, uh, excuse me, 2002, um, uh, called Republican Party of Minnesota versus White, in which the court said that um, candidates for elected office, including uh, judicial races, have First Amendment rights to disclose their positions on hot button topics like the death penalty, like abortion, uh, et cetera, so long as they don't make pledges or promises. Um, the case itself said uh, very little uh, to nothing about recusal rules. That is, it said that uh, you could campaign on a certain platform, but didn't go the next step and say, and if you do so, what is the consequence uh, for cases that you can hear? Um, that uh, second issue was raised in a case called Caperton versus Massey Cole, which is 2009. Um, in which a divided court said um, that there were due process limits um, that might require recusal. In that case, um, a justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court, whose campaign had largely been funded by um, one uh, um, individual uh, who had interest in, a, uh, interest in a company before the court, um, uh, appealed to the Supreme Court of uh, West Virginia and uh, the justice who had won the election based almost entirely on uh, the campaign uh, contributions and campaign efforts, independent campaign expenditures of this uh, one party, um, actually uh, failed to recuse himself from the case. Uh, and the Supreme Court of the United States said that uh, when there is a probability of actual bias uh, that is unconstitutionally high, then due process requires a justice uh, or a judge to uh, recuse himself or herself from the case. The third case that has come up is just from last term, which is called williams Uly versus Florida Bar. Uh, that's a 2015 case um, at last term. And that's uh, a case in which the question was uh, whether the state has a compelling interest, notwithstanding uh, the First Amendment, uh, to keep uh, candidates who are running for elected office for um, uh, uh, judge or Supreme Court justice uh, for making direct solicitations uh, for campaign cash. Uh, 
Uh, and the, the court in a 5-4 decision said, notwithstanding we usually subject First Amendment and uh, First Amendment political speech to strict scrutiny, uh, the court said that the uh, interest in maintaining the public confidence uh, in the integrity of the judicial branch um, was sufficient to overcome uh, whatever First Amendment objections that there might be, and therefore uh, it was constitutional to prohibit um, direct uh, solicitations by a judicial candidate. Um, what is interesting about this case, as I said, is you have this confluence of these sort of three strands. You have the issue about uh, the due process limits on um, on what kind of cases an elected judiciary, uh, elected judicial official can hear, uh, whether the elected judicial official uh, can, in fact, uh, cause some concern about impartiality by statements that he or she might make on the stump uh, while running, um, and also uh, the uh, uh, greater issue about the uh, interest that uh, we all have in not just the actual percept the actual um, lack of bias of an elected official, but also the perception of bias. The final little wrinkle in this particular case uh, is um, the issue about even if um, the Chief Justice had not been the deciding vote, is the fact that um, he participated in the decision sufficient to cast some doubt on the integrity of the judiciary, sufficient to say that uh, he should be constitutionally mandated to have recused himself from the case. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Miller. We're going to hear uh, next from uh, Professor Metzlaw, but if I could just for a moment. Sure. Uh, it, w what I see emerging already, and, and what Professors Griffin and, and uh, Miller have had to say, is are, are areas of law in which it, it makes sense to think of the court as ideologically divided into areas in which it's not. Uh, so Professor Griffin mentioned some areas like sentencing um, or the confrontation clause in which the court seems more divided methodologically than ideologically. The death penalty, uh, it seems like you have um, some quite stark ideological divisions. Uh, Professor Miller talked about public employee unions and collective action problems or free rider problems as, as a, uh, a justification for government regulation. The court is fractured in that context the same way it was over whether the Commerce Clause supports the individual mandate in the health care law, in part to overcome free rider problems. Just last term in a takings case called Horn uh, and involving a government regulation of raisins, it, again, there was a collective action issue of whether these raisin growers can benefit from a government program and then still sue for a taking, and the court split that same way. When you get to the integrity, uh, the perception and reality of judicial integrity, sometimes uh, Justice Kennedy joins the liberals. Sometimes it's the chief. You can't really carve the court up ideologically. Affirmative action, um, well, Professor Metzlis, I think Metzlis is going to tell us a lot about whether uh, an ideological split makes sense in that area of law. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, <clears throat> I've been reading all these articles about this year's Supreme Court, and uh, one of them started with a quote from Yogi Berra, maybe just because it was appropriate, but, you know, it, it's deja vu all over again. And there's a certain amount of first Mondays that are that way. It seems like there's an excitement about the court. Uh, there are some of the same things going on. One of the things that you'll get at the beginning of any court term is what the Supreme Court is not doing, and we heard a little about that from Professor Griffin. So breaking news today, San, Ho San Jose will not be able to challenge the baseball antitrust exemption, cert denied. <laughs> Madoff investors won't be able to challenge the distribution plan. And one that I'm very disappointed in is an, employer who th an employee who thinks that Social Security numbers are the mark of the beast will not get her, uh, his case heard before the Supreme Court. But uh, the Supreme Court denies tons of cases, and we, 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 there's an awful lot about what we don't do, and sometimes people read in more to that than they should. But part of the deja vu moment for the first year is, is kind of looking at the first Monday, is kind of thinking about, uh, well, how is the court split? What's going on? What are the powers? And I think, in fact, that changes a little bit. If this was last year, we would be looking at a trend where the Supreme Court had over two-thirds of its cases uh, decided by a unanimous vote a couple of terms ago. And there was a thought that, hey, we were now entering this new era of the court getting along, maybe because they were picking the right cases to try to decide things. Chief Justice Roberts, who we're now in the 10th year of his term, and we're now beginning to understand his, trying to think very hard about his legacy. That's kind of the theme now, is what is this Roberts court? He talked about trying to get you know, more 
agreement among the justices, uh, more decision making. He did talk about more decisions being made for you know the corporate uh, uh, America to come up with clearer rules to things. That's not what we're talking about now. So even that would just have been a year ago. It's not deja vu all over again. We are very concerned at, at many just, uh, people with the, the sort of rancor among the justices and the kind of discussion that's going on there. They seem to be more public. Uh, we, we have real splits uh, that have become, you know, sort of front page news. Uh, now, maybe this is all just our society, who knows. But this is also an election year. And when Chief, you know, the debate, if you watched it with Ted Cruz, a former law clerk to Chief Justice Rehnquist, as was John Roberts, talking about the mistake that was made by appointing John Roberts, I thought it was a pretty amazing moment. Uh, and so we always get interested in the politics during an election year, and there's going to be more this year, I think, than and, uh, in the past couple of uh, presidential elections, because at least on the Republican side, this real concern that we have, you know, for years elected Republican presidents who've nominated justices and they don't deliver on what it is that they want to deliver. Uh, I think there's a lot to uh, false in, in, in uh, Senator Cruz's attack on Chief Justice Roberts, but this is the first time we've ever had a Supreme Court where the ideology, ideological profile of the justices lines up perfectly with who the presidents who nominated them. In the past, we've always had the surprise candidates like Justice Souter or Justice uh, Brennan who were nominated by Republicans, but now you can align them ideologically by the president who appointed them. We talked a little bit about clustering, and let me, before I get to Fisher, let's talk a little bit about some other areas of clustering, which I think no doubt is part of the legacy of the Roberts course that is undeniable. This is a civil procedure Supreme Court, a court that has been looking and, and maybe either radically or at least significantly rethinking what it was that we thought was the American way of litigation. And this year, we'll have a clustering of a at least three class action cases coming on the heels of the uh, 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 Walmart case, where the court rejected, in a very significant opinion, potentially, the utility of the class actions for that context. Now, that was a very unwieldy case. It was every woman who ever had worked for Walmart millions of people, and I think even Justice Ginsburg in her dissent said, you know, maybe this should have been split up in different ways, but I don't like what we're going. Uh, this year we're going to have, a, this term we have an opinion that we'll see if the Supreme, where the Supreme Court's going to go on class actions. We know with class actions and arbitrations, the Supreme Court has split ideologically five to four with the Republican conservative justices approving arbitration over increasingly vociferous dissents of the Democratic nominated uh, justices uh, culminating in the Concepcion and uh, uh, Italian Colors case from uh, last year. But this year we have an interesting case. It doesn't seem, you know, that weighty, but it's uh, Tyson Foods, be argued next, in November. We have 3,000 meat workers from a, a plant in Iowa. A uh, class action case saying, hey, you're not paying us. We have to spend about 15 minutes getting all this stuff on, you know, and uh, you're not paying us for it. And the evidence that went in was an expert came in and looked at a sample of some of the 3,000 class members and came up with an estimate of, let's say, 15 minutes of time. It varied, depended on the job. Some of the people took a little longer, a little less, but you know, are you going to put on evidence about 3,000 different people? The whole utility of class action is to cut through some of the uncertainty of that. And the Eighth Circuit permitted a, a class action award based upon sort of trial by sort of, you know, sampling. And yet in Walmart, the Supreme Court had said, be careful, we really need common issues. We've got to be very careful that each of the members of the class is there. So, you know, the Eighth Circuit upheld it. And, you know, any time the Supreme Court grants cert, if you want to bet, uh, and I should give up betting because my FanDuel teams are doing terribly in fantasy <laughs> football, um, you're going to bet for reversal. The Supreme Court reverses two-thirds of the time. And especially a case like, so, you know, grant, we used to call it grant to reverse, you know, just Anytime you read a decision, you can assume that the, if, if you were a justice who liked it, you're not going to vote to grant cert. So the people, you know, you need four justices to grant cert. It's usually those who don't like the opinion. And so here, some sense that the court's going to come in and say, no, this is not appropriate for class action. Another sort of interesting case, um, which has really profound, uh, you know, Article Three issues, is, is a case called Spokio versus Robbins. We have somebody who's suing a, 
some kind of an internet company that posts information about you. And the information was false, but it actually was kind of positive. They said that this person had higher education and higher credentials than he had. So no real damages. But he's filed a class action lawsuit. He gets the statutory damages. Uh, but the defendants are saying, wait a minute, you haven't been hurt. The Constitution requires a real injury. Uh, you weren't hurt. So we can't create statutory, you know, you can't just take $500 when you weren't hurt at all. And so lots of potential issues depending on how they go, either about class actions here or some sense of what is the nature of injury in fact. Uh, this court has shown a real interest in standing, and this case might do it. But let's talk about Fisher. And this really is a deja vu uh, all over again because uh, Fisher was already to the Supreme Court. So a little bit of background involves the University of Texas. And Texas originally uh, was uh, ordered by the Fifth Circuit in a case called Hopwood to give up using any racial preferences at all. And uh, uh, concerned with what that would do to the admissions profiles at the University of Texas, the legislature passed a law called the 10% rule that if you graduate in the top 10% of your high school class, you'd be admitted to UT, very desirable place to go. Uh, and that was done, and it had a significant effect to create diversity within the uh, student body at UT. Why? Well, you'll have high schools that have, you know, predominantly Latino, predominantly African American uh, are the demographics. And if you're in the top 10% in your class, you get into UT. Now, over time, uh, it did. It, there's no question that it created a significant degree of diversity within the University of Texas, but the admissions officials looking at it still found some uh, what they thought were severe and significant problems, either in particular parts of the university, some of their special admissions programs, uh, or clustering within particular majors. And uh, they decided to add on to the 10% rule what we'll call the holistic review. Holistic is definitely a, a word you hear a lot in the admissions context. And this was what the Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, had permitted in the Grutter case from Michigan, Michigan Law School, where, uh, done at the time by Dennis Shields, who became Duke Law's admissions director, so we you know, remember talking with them about it, they would look at the whole file. They would look at everything about the applicant and consider, uh, and not just base it on LSATs or SATs, look at everything they could, to, uh, students could write a diversity essay, an applicant, and they would consider all those factors, one of which could be race uh, or uh, uh, ethnicity, and that could be a factor in, in the decision. And the goal was to create a, uh, a certain core group of, of uh, minority students, a critical mass was the language that Michigan used, because if you didn't have somewhere between 12 and 18 percent uh, minority candidates, then it would, it would cause issues and the diversity benefits of education wouldn't succeed. So they added that on top of the 10 percent rule. Abigail Fisher was an applicant to the University of Texas. She did not, she was not in the top 10 percent, and she challenged it saying, you know, I'm competing for a very small number. The top 10 percent admitted most of the class at the University of Texas. Not a lot of spots left. And her position was, you know, what are, what are my chances as a, you know, a white person here to compete for uh, the few remaining spots when they're going to use this Grutter holistic diversity rule, taking race especially into account for what's left? Now, the evidence did show that she wouldn't have gotten in under any circumstances. She, she wasn't that close, but nonetheless, she was permitted to go forward. The Fifth Circuit upheld it and said, this is fine. The university officials, Grutter, said you can do this sort of holistic review. They're just combining two programs. It's still all the same. And the Supreme Court granted cert. And, and, and it really was the, the debate you know, a couple years ago was, well, what's the Supreme Court going to do? Are they going to overrule Grutter? Because we know, and, and Professor Siegel certainly will speak to this, uh, you know, we know from their Seattle High School cases that uh, Chief Justice Roberts is against racial balancing. He thinks the best way to stop race, stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, which is sort of circularly true, uh, but controversial in its own way. Uh, and uh, we were expecting a major decision then. And, you know, you, it's hard to get behind the curtain sometimes, but w w it, it looked as if at least some of the justices would overrule Grutter and say affirmative action and go back to this vision of a, the colorblind constitution. But we didn't get that. Instead, we got a, a uh, sometimes called a tame decision. Some people say the Supreme Court punted. Uh, but in a, uh, a sort of uh, decision written by Justice Kennedy, uh, 
uh, joined in by uh, the majority of the liberals and the majority of the conservatives, the court said, hey, we are remanding. This requires strict scrutiny. This is a classification based on race. Yes, diversity is a compelling state interest, but you need to really look at it. You need to look at the means. How else could you have done it? And they remanded it. So it's kind of a non-decision. Uh, Justice Thomas, as we have known from his Grutter dissent, said, no, we should have declared it unconstitutional. Justice Scalia says, nobody asked us to overrule Grutter, which is true. Or, or, uh, the lawyers for Fisher have not asked explicitly for overruling F Grutter, although that's never stopped the Supreme Court before when it was wanted to do that. And um, he's, it's kind of like his opinion was, I wish they had because I would have, but you, he would not know that. He says, nobody asked us to overreview it, so I'll join Justice Kennedy's opinion. Uh, Justice Ginsburg did state, uh, uh, sort of, to kind of balance, I think, Thomas, is that this was appropriate, we should have been able to stay it. So it went back on remand, and it's interesting. One question was, should this have gone all the way back to the trial court? Did we need more facts? Because as an admission policy, this sort of evolves and changes over time. You've had different people implementing it. The, why they put it in has never been very clear, and the specifics of it are not very clear. And some people thought that the Supreme Court uh, a remand would have required going back and doing some more additional evidentiary work, but that didn't happen. The Fifth Circuit said, well, think about it. It makes sense. No, I think we got enough. Let's, let's go and decide it. The other question is standing. Uh, Abigail Fisher went to the Louisiana State University and graduated. Why, why are we still litigating this? Fifth Circuit said, good question, but that issue was before the Supreme Court the first time, so I, I, we, don't, we don't get it either, but we must assume they're standing. And in the same split as the Fifth Circuit had before, two to one vote, long opinion, upheld what they had done before, looking uh, under strict scrutiny, looking at what Texas done, saying this is legitimate, it basically supports Grutter. So we're, we are back in the Supreme Court with all those questions still there. You know, uh, Justice Thomas and probably Justice Scalia, uh, are they ready to uh, overrule Grutter and, and sort of say no affirmative action in the United States? That's certainly a possibility, even though it's not express. Uh, we know for certain that Justice Ginsburg and I think the other uh, liberals will work very hard to uh, 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 not do that. And there is still the potential for a more narrow decision, the decision that says this was too much, this was adding one thing on top of another. Uh, you really can't do both. Uh, and under strict scrutiny, you know, we, you have to have a close fit of the means, you know, least restrictive alternative, and this wasn't this. There were other ways to achieve this and sort of overrule this but leave Grutter in place. But it's a very significant p decision, potentially, and I think one that will, will certainly have the focus of uh, the American uh, legal community. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Metzloff. To tie together where you began and where you ended, it's not just that uh, you said she didn't appear like she would get in in the absence of an affirmative action program, and she went somewhere else and already has graduated, but it's not a class action. Not a class action. It's not a class action, which could keep the case alive. I once asked Justice Scalia, uh, to explain why there is standing, um, um, uh, the ability to bring suit um, uh, under a doctrine that requires cognizable harm to the individual in, in every affirmative action case. And, um, uh, well, I, didn't, I did not receive um, uh, a satisfactory uh, satisfactory. Is the phrase something like uh, you can't you can't review? But it's a procedural error. It's viewed as that you have a right to be considered in a process that's not tainted by unlawful racial discrimination. Um, is the way the court, the way the court views it. Uh, all right. So let me just say very briefly. I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, there's a, a big voting rights case, Evan Well against Abbott, on the docket, and it involves uh, one person, one vote. Uh, something that the court decided in the 60s in a case called Reynolds against Sims that, that required state legislative districts to uh, contain roughly the same number of voters. It was very controversial at the time it was decided. It's black letter law today. That principle is not being challenged. What's being challenged is how the counting takes place. Uh, do states get to decide whether it's all people who live in the district uh, that are counted for purposes of one person, one vote, or is it only eligible voters? Uh, and um, does the uh, Constitution require uh, that one person, one vote means you're restricted to the voting population when you're apportioning state legislative districts? And this is another case that's being brought by um, what Adam Liptak in today's New York Times called legal entrepreneurs, uh, specifically conservative advocacy groups, 
uh, that want to see the court require in the name of the Constitution uh, that it be, in fact, um, one voter, one vote, which would shift political power from more urban areas, which tend to vote more Democratic, to more rural areas, which tend to vote more Republican. So this is uh, a, another case with a clear, not just ideological, but partisan inflection, uh, and a case in which if they, in deciding if they split 5-4 along ideological lines, um, I don't think it's going to uh, right, um, uh, speak well of uh, uh, the idea of the court as an institution that is not just institutionally, but also substantively uh, separated from partisan politics. There are two cases that have not been granted yet, uh, but I would uh, uh, think it's more likely than not they will. Uh, last year at this time, the two biggest cases uh, that were decided during the October 2014 had not yet been granted, and that was King against Burwell and Obergefell against Hodges, uh, the Affordable Care Act subsidies case, as well as the constitutionality of state bans on same-sex marriage. So sometimes some of the most important cases uh, are not yet on the docket officially during First Monday, and I think we have two of them. The, uh, one is, I think we're going to likely see uh, one of the court's most important abortion decision since 2007, the last time it took up uh, the issue, and I think uh, there's a Mississippi case uh, which imposed uh, a law that would close the remaining clinic in the state. And apropos of uh, the Gaines case in the years before Brown was decided, the state is saying that, well, um, people can go out of state to get an abortion. Uh, in the Gaines case, it was people go, uh, African Americans can go out of state to get a, a legal education, will pay for it. Right? That's consistent with Plessy. Uh, and the court said, no, uh, will the court take that case? I think uh, the Texas case is even. More important, uh, again, it involves what's called these trap laws, these targeted regulation of abortion providers, laws that restrict access to abortion not in the name of protecting fetal life, but in the name of protecting women's health. Uh, and this law, by imposing various requirements called ambulatory surgical requirements, admitting privileges requirements, uh, would reduce the number of clinics uh, that provide access to abortion in the state, a state of 27 million people, from more than 40 to less than 10. Uh, the Fifth Circuit, with uh, very minor exceptions, upheld the entire law. The Supreme Court stayed the judgment of the Fifth Circuit by a vote of five to four, which makes it more likely than not, I think, that the court is going to grant, uh, grant the case. And we'll see uh, what, uh, what remains of Casey's undue burden standard, uh, the legal standard uh, that provides uh, that laws that have the purpose or effect of imposing a substantial obstacle on the path of a pregnant woman seeking access to abortion pre-viability. Uh, how much of Casey uh, remains on the Roberts Court? It's a standard initially articulated by Justice O'Connor, subsequently embraced by the court. Uh, the other case uh, that I think is likely to be granted, and there's a lot of them at the court now, but I think um, uh, it'll either take a bunch and consolidate them or take uh, take one that, prov that, that raises the issues in the best possible light, provides the best vehicle for the court's consideration involves uh, this trade-off between contraceptive access and religious uh, liberty. Uh, and this is uh, sort of Hobby Lobby part two. This is a case being brought by religious nonprofits who are exempted by uh, federal law from having to provide cost-free access to contraception to their employees. Uh, but the nonprofits in these cases object to the exemption. They say the exemption uh, and the, uh, the accommodations being provided by the government themselves violate their rights to religious liberty under a federal law called RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, what the accommodation, in order to qualify for the exemption, uh, they, these nonprofits either have to write a letter uh, to the government or fill out a government form expressing their religious objections and identifying their insurance company. And it's that requirement to identify the insurance company that the nonprofits say makes them complicit in sin, uh, violates their religious freedom. Uh, uh, every circuit, um, uh, uh, D.C., the 3rd, the 5th, and the 10th, rejected this claim. The 8th Circuit recently accepted it, at least on a motion for a preliminary injunction at the beginning of the case, uh, accepted the claim. So there now is a clear circuit split on a very important question of federal law, and I suspect uh, the court is going to hear that case as well. All right, so we have uh, some time. Uh, l let's hear from you folks now. Questions, comments, concerns, objections, vehement agreement, nominations. No. What's on your mind? Someone get us started. Don't make me cold call you. <laughs> Don't do that. Yes. Yeah. So with Fisher, um, the like, I guess the standing issue, like redressability. 
Is that because people, maybe other than Fisher herself, are taking that up as a way to sort of attack affirmative action? Or is that, I don't know. Um, I, I thought your question was, has somebody else stepped into Fisher's shoes as the plaintiff in the case? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, uh, you know, so it's, you know, there is standing doctrine that if something is, you know, you, there's nobody else likely to do that, you know, so it's, it's impossible to get the review, you kind of grant standing, but that wouldn't seem to be the case here. There's, you know, 30,000 people a year applying to the University of Texas, and if somebody's upset, you'd expect there to be a, a, a new plaintiff to pop up. So the standing thing is, it's puzzled me from, for a long time, and I guess it's, if you ask, it's Scalia's normally the first one to be jumping up and down about uh, standing, so. There's, yeah, and there's some ideological flipping going on within, it would also be sure. outside the context of affirmative action, that it used to be legal conservatives really insisted on rigorous Article Three standing requirements. Uh, now you see, um, uh, think about the, the, the suit by the House of Representatives uh, and the House seeking standing for itself, uh, and you have legal conservatives defending that and legal liberals um, saying that there's no standing. Um, so, so I think you see... Um, the ideological valence of who's invoking standing objections and, and who's opposing them uh, seems to be changing. But from the start, uh, the, view about, uh, the view about standing in affirmative action cases by the court has been uh, that an individual can bring the case uh, and it's not mooted out, um, uh, even if they graduate, even if it's not a, affirmative, even if it's not a, a, um, a class action. And the only way I, the best way I could think about it is that uh, I was, I was deprived of my right to be considered in a process that's untainted by unlawful discrimination. That's the injury uh, that remains to be redressed. It's a pro, uh, uh, kind of like a process injury. Not that I'm going to get in now. It, it'll be interesting if we can sort of jump in to see how, um, you know, if the court deals with the, the standing issue at all, which I, I'm skeptical that they yeah, will. Yeah, I don't. Right. I don't think that. Right. But in light of the fact that you've got these other cases about class actions and, and that, are, that are essentially about, you know, when does somebody suffer an injury, which is basically a kind of standing question about when does the court have the subject matter jurisdiction authority to hear anything as opposed to just wax eloquent about what they think, you know, the law should be. That's the basic notion of why we have standing doctrine. Uh, even though you know many many times the 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 court will just um, sort of elide over that issue. Yes. I wanted you to talk a little bit more about the Texas case and in particular whether or not the court would need to basically reconsider what happened in Casey and create a new standard instead of undue burden, mm -hmm. or could they hold that closing down? You know, as you said in Texas, about seventy five percent of the clinics is still permissible under undue burden? Because it seems like that is pretty impermissible. So I'm just wondering what kind of logical steps they would have to make in that case. Right. So this is the Texas case involving um, uh, regulations of abortion that require abortion clinics to be outfitted, outfitted as ambulatory surgical centers and to require the doctors who provide abortions to have admitting privileges at hospitals within 30 miles of the clinic. Uh, Justice Kennedy. Uh, embraced the undue burden standard in Casey. He purported to be applying it in Stenberg against Carhartt as well as Gonzalez against Carhartt. Uh, at, uh, this late in the day, I doubt uh, he's going to reject the standard and apply a different one, uh, particularly because the standard, as Justice Scalia criticized it in the past, uh, is sufficiently malleable uh, that it could, right, uh, it could be employed to reach different outcomes. Uh, the fact that he joined Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan in staying the judgment of the Fifth Circuit, and the four other uh, justices would have allowed the Fifth Circuit ruling to remain in effect, suggests to me that he still thinks the undue burden standard has some teeth, uh, that either there's either a purpose here or an effect of imposing a substantial obstacle. You're talking about women of limited means having to tra travel you know, 150 miles one way, uh, you're talking about um, a vast region of the state, right, west of San Antonio, uh, this, in which there's no clinic available, and the state is saying, well, they can go to New Mexico to get uh, an abortion. Now, think about that, because the state purports to be justifying these regulations in the name of women's health, that the clinics have to be outfitted in such a way as to protect women's health, and yet Texas has no control 
over how New Mexico regulates or doesn't regulate mm -hmm. the provision of abortion services. And so I think that does speak to the, pro the purpose prong of Casey. What's the purpose here? Uh, and independent of that, I think you have an effects analysis. So I think if he wants to uh, uh, say that uh, you can go so far and no further and this is too far, I think Casey allows him to do that. Um, uh, if he wants to uh, uphold what the Fifth Circuit did, um, I myself think it's harder because I think Casey was a compromise that meant something. The court neither overruled Roe. Uh, nor sustained it in full. And I think the Fifth Circuit reads Casey as, as an empty vessel, as just we can't review at all what the state's purpose is, uh, and we're just going to give deference to what they state their purpose is. If there's no medical evidence suggesting that the clinics need to do this, uh, whether the doctors need to have these privileges, we're still going to defer to their medical judgment, which is not what the court did in Gonzalez against Carhartt, where it cut back on abortion rights. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I think Kennedy will do what he will do, and he will use the undue burden standard uh, to accomplish it, uh, but I myself think that, right, uh, unless you are ready to just overrule Casey, uh, it's really not tenable to say that you can reduce the number of clinics in a state of almost 30 million people to under 10 and still purport to be conducting meaningful judicial review of what states do to regulate abortion. Other questions? Yes. This is related to the um, Texas abortion laws, and actually gets at what you just said about um, medical opinions. But I think one of the things that some people found frustrating about Hobby Lobby was that this, the court didn't seem to really look at the facts. They just sort of took at face value mm -hmm. Hobby Lobby's contention that these forms of contraception actually caused abortion. So do you think that in looking at the Texas laws that there will be any attempt to examine what Texas claims <coughs> about the safety of women in these situations? Yeah, no, good question. In Gonzalez against Carhartt, the court did what the Fifth Circuit declined to do in the Texas case, which is that it examined the facts put forth by Congress in regulating so-called so partial birth abortion, and it rejected some of them. Congress found as a fact that this controversial procedure is not taught at top medical schools. The court rejected that because it's not true. Congress found as a fact that there is a consensus that this procedure is never required to protect the physical health of women, and the court rejected that because it's not true. Uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So, so the court did that the last time it considered an abortion case. In Hobby Lobby, uh, there were uh, four of the 20 required uh, methods of abortion that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Greens, who owned the Hobby Lobby um, Corporation, said were abortifacients. And it was demonstrably false, I think, in the case of three of them. And there was still some uncertainty with respect to the fourth. Uh, the court... Uh, did not say that uh, anything really turned on this, that if they view it as a substantial burden in good faith, it's a substantial burden. But Justice Kennedy, in his concurring opinion, and, and his concurring opinion is the law, because he's the fifth vote, uh, he's, what really seemed to make the difference for him is the fact that the government could give them the same accommodation they give to religious nonprofits. And so I think if you ask Justice Alito, whatever people say is a substantial burden is a substantial burden, don't tell me what the science says. Uh, but I'm not sure that's the case for Justice Kennedy, that, that literally anything is going to go. Uh, you can say that um, uh, you know, something that is medically shown to prevent, right, uh, not to prevent implantation still qualifies as an abortifacient. It's not clear to me that he's going he's gonna to sign off on all of that. But it's hard to know what Justice Kennedy is, is going to be prepared to do, um, because there are other cases in which you can say he's ignoring facts or making up his own. Yes. So I have another question regarding Fisher. Um, there's been a lot of interesting social science research about affirmative action and its effects. And I'm thinking, as I'm sure you guys are familiar with, of this book, Mismatch, um, how affirmative action hurts the students it's intended to help. Mm -hmm. um, the book came out before they heard Fisher the first time. But given that they punted, or at least some people think that they punted, um, do you think that kind of research on the actual impact of affirmative action will somehow make its way into their reasoning, or will they kind of put it to the side? I think Justice Thomas has referred to it uh, in, in many respects in his opinion. Uh, some of its predecessors in Grutter and certainly did in Fisher. So it's, it's, it's known to them, uh, like, like all the cases similar to this, the, 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 the huge number of amicus briefs. So that information is there. Uh, and how the justices deal with that kind of uh, social science evidence is, is a fascinating legal question that uh, plays across many, many cases. Yeah, it's fascinating to hear Justice Thomas say, on the one hand, it's irrelevant what the social science says because the Constitution categorically requires colorblindness, and then on the other hand to say, but even though it's irrelevant, I'm going to go on and on at length to explain to you 
why affirmative action is deeply harmful to its intended beneficiaries. And so uh, that does raise questions about whether uh, it's really so irrelevant after all um, uh, uh, to Justice Thomas and those who view the issue like him. And also, I think, for uh, those on the other side of the court, uh, if they became persuaded that affirmative action was really harmful on balance, uh, I think they would be, um, they still might end up deferring, but I think they would be less, right, left, less deferential than they are. So I think there's, there's a disagreement on both sides about, um, uh, about effects, and I think both sides view it as relevant. I think it's because the justices are good lawyers. They took civil procedure. I understand you can plead in the alternative. So there you go. You know, you can say on the one hand this and on the other hand this. <laughs> you, can, you're right, you can plead in the alternative, but when you argue in the alternative, you don't typically say that my alternative argument is legally irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> you say it's legally decisive if you reject the first argument, right? So well, I think yeah. there's, there's something a little bit different. One justice has been, I think, pretty clear about saying the social science evidence is interesting, but we don't consider it as Justice Alito. Now, I don't know if he's been as in, inconsistent, but I, I think of several of his opinions where he, so I, I don't think that's what he's reading, and that's, I don't think that's what he's paying attention to. And you see the division among the conservatives. I mean, what's, it's, it's one of the real interesting trends the last, you know, in, in the same-sex marriage case, each of the conservative justices felt compelled to write their own con dissenting opinion, where the, the liberal justices have uh, sort of got their act together and they're, they're happy to just let Justice Kennedy write the opinion. I'm, they may have had something else they wanted to add to it. But the conservatives seem to, you know, we definitely different, maybe it's like the Republican debate. So there's a, you know, lots of different voices out there. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think Justice Alito, w w w that's not the reason why he's, you know, and his vote in, in Fisher is interesting. I, don't, I, don't, I, 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 I think he may be a key to how this case goes down. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you to my colleagues. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And uh, again, happy first Monday. Happy first Monday.